good afternoon and a warm welcome to this policy dialogue organized by the European Policy Center in cooperation with the UK mission to the European Union to discuss the future role of the United Kingdom in the Balkan region. The UK might have already left the European Union, but it has not left Europe. And of course, the Balkan countries are an integral part of Europe, surrounded as they are by EU member states. So far, the UK's approach towards the Balkans has been shaped by the EU's enlargement policy, which seeks to support the gradual process of integration of the Balkan countries in the Union all the way to full membership. Traditionally, the UK has been a consistent supporter of the EU, EU's expansion. While many have explained this position as being partly driven by the UK's desire to prevent a further deepening of political ties within the Union, over the decades, this stance has nevertheless benefited the would-be EU members in the Balkans, mostly in a political sense, that is, because Britain's power in the region has not really been of an economic type. All this, of course, could change now after Brexit, uh, when the UK will have to develop its own priorities to shape its relationship with the Balkan countries. London has already started working on elaborating foreign policy strategies with its European partners, including the Balkans, on a range of issues from security, defense and development to the rule of law and civil society. These policies seem to suggest that global Britain intends to remain committed to the Balkans. But is this the case? Will the UK continue to be an ally for the EU hopeful countries in the Balkan region? To what extent will the UK's priorities and objectives for the Balkans align to those of the EU and its member states? Can we expect continuity or change to the UK's approach to the region? With EU accession remaining the key driver for reforms in the Balkans, what role can the UK play outside of formal EU structures? To discuss this and other related questions, I have a terrific panel of speakers lined up, including Miriam Lexman, member of the European Parliament for the European People's Party Group, Andrew Page, head of Western Balkans Department at the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, his Excellency Matt Field, a UK ambassador to Bosnia and Herzegovina, and Senada Selosavic, senior research fellow at the Zagreb Institute for Development and International Relations. Thank you all very much for taking the time to speak with us today. We will first hear from the panel and then everyone in the audience will have the chance and will be encouraged to ask questions live or in written as you prefer. And I would like to, to start with Mr. Page. What implications does the UK's departure from the EU have on the Balkan region? Thank you very much, Corinna, for a very nice introduction. And thank you to you and your EPC colleagues for excellent organization of today's session and uh, for a very good, clear introduction. I'll do what I can to answer your question in under 10 minutes, but happy to return to these points in Q&A later. And indeed, the timing is great for us, fortuitously a little bit, because we had the publication of the integrated review on foreign defense and security policy yesterday. And indeed, the foreign secretary is making a speech about that today, which I commend to you all. So first of all, I wanted just to uh, outline who I am and then come on to uh, what I'm gonna cover. Uh, my name's Andrew Page. I've been in the foreign office since the early nineties, uh, but just to recap quickly where I've worked, my three postings have been in Ukraine, where I worked on the know-how fund, technical assistance fund in the early nineties. Second posting was in Paris, uh, where I was there in the early 2000s, working on the Middle East. And then the third posting was as ambassador, British ambassador in Slovenia, 2009 to 13, culminating uh, just at the point when Croatia came into the EU. Since then, I've been back in the UK and I headed up the team that organized the Western Balkans Summit in London in 2018. And then I've been in this job as the head of the Western Balkans department uh, since September 2018, and it's a four-year job. So that's me in a nutshell, a lot of that time working very closely with European colleagues and partners. What I want to cover in my 10 minutes or just under is first of all, why the Western Balkans matter to the UK. Secondly, how the British government right across HMG has responded from the summit year of 2018 
up to the present day and the integrated review published this week. Thirdly, a word about European context. Fourthly, a kind of reminder really of UK equities and opportunities that the UK has to offer our partners around the world in Europe and in the US and elsewhere. And then finally, my conclusion, which will be about the UK's enduring commitment to the Western Balkans, uh, working closely with those partners. So let me start, if I may, with our UK interests and why the Western Balkans matter to the UK. And if I'm honest with you, I don't see that very differently now from when we had a really good hard look at it in 2018 uh, ahead of our summit. I've got about uh, nine or 10 tiers here, which I'll run through quickly. Number one, uh, Europe's security is our UK national security. So what happens in the Western Balkans affects us all across Europe, including in the UK. Secondly, I would mention that Russia and China are very active in large parts of the Western Balkans, which we tend to describe as a contested region, and to some extent representing a challenge to its Euro-Atlantic trajectory. Thirdly, we, the UK, are a member of the Quint, and as such, we work very hard to support the Serbia-Kosovo dialogue and to maintain stability in Bosnia and Herzegovina, both crucial upstream security-enhancing activities. Fourthly, I would mention serious and organized crime, sometimes abbreviated to SOC. Uh, serious and organized crime from the Western Balkans directly affects the UK. It particularly highlights that Albanian organized crime groups control a significant proportion of the UK's cocaine market. Fifthly, coronavirus has been a very stark reminder to us all of the socioeconomic fragility in the Western Balkans region and the tendency for authoritarianism to grow in some places. And this has heightened risks to security and created vulnerabilities, which are sometimes exploited by organized crime groups. Uh, the sixth point is that the UK has invested very heavily historically in international justice in the region and indeed in peace support operations, which we continue to do with UK personnel in K4 and seconded to the NATO office in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Seventh point is that we've been prominent in promotion of reconciliation since the 1990s conflicts, including particularly war crimes, missing persons, and pre pre preventing sexual violence uh, in conflict. And these lie at, our heart, at the heart of our aim today, uh, as the Foreign Secretary puts it, to be a force for good in the world. Uh, the eighth point is on environment and COP26 and climate where our hosting of the COP26 uh, summit in Glasgow later this year offers us the chance to build environmental profile and to work with the Western Balkans partners. And the final point I would make is that we are continuously working and will continue to, to improve law enforcement, to increase defense collaboration, and indeed can increase cyber resilience in the Western Balkans, as well as build up trade and investment and scientific cooperation. So there, in a nutshell, are our equities and indeed uh, why the Western Balkans matter to the UK. So what have we done in response? Uh, going back to 2018, when I started actually October 2017, but we worked for a year to build up our plans for July 2018 and the Western Balkans Summit in London. It was under the Berlin process and it deliberately set out the parameters for our cross-government response in London and in the UK uh, towards the Western Balkans, intentionally looking a decade ahead uh, to where our interests lay and looking to play to UK strengths. And at the time, before we hosted the summit, Chancellor Merkel of Germany had offered the UK the chance to host the Berlin Process Summit, I think in part to enable us to prove precisely our commitment to remain a serious, ongoing geopolitical player in the Western Balkans as much after our EU exit as before. And that was our intention as we approached the summit to have an enduring role as a foreign and security policy heavyweight in that part of Southeast Europe. And that was the challenge we set out to respond to. So our ministers agreed at the summit, as some of you will recall from those days, to do three things. Number one was to draw on political and diplomatic influence by agreeing joint declarations which we did with all the leaders of the Berlin process on bilateral disputes, on missing persons and on war crimes. And I would particularly highlight that on bilateral disputes, the breakthrough on the name issue between Greece and North Macedonia came just a month before our summit, which boosted our work on good neighborly relations. Secondly, uh, to leverage our experience in digital and entrepreneurship 
including in the city, uh, with a view to tackling high youth unemployment and helping to stem brain drain. And that work continues. And then the third point was building a new kind of aspect of the Berlin process, if you like, a new volley, which was to combat serious and organized crime and corruption by introducing the first interior ministers meeting to the process on which the UK still leads, known as the uh, steering group on the security commitments. Uh, and we also secured agreements on modern slavery and pledges on anti-corruption, which we've been following up since. So the last thing I'd say about the summit is that in fulfillment of our announcement uh, at the Western Balkans summit, uh, we uh, I said that we were going to increase our program spending significantly, which we have done. And we also said that we would double our footprint of UK personnel working in the region on tackling shared security related challenges, including serious and organized crime, which we are in the process of doing and we very nearly doubled. So just pausing there, um, and rolling forward, if I may, to 2021 and our response, which you will have seen yesterday in the integrated review uh, on global Britain and on foreign security and defense policy around the world. I want to highlight four quotes from that review. It's 100 pages long, but we've been through it in order to filter the ones that are really most relevant to the Western Balkans and indeed to the wider European neighborhood. And the ones I would highlight would be these. Number one. We will seek to shape the international order of the future by working with others to demonstrate the benefits of liberal democracies and free markets and to shape the norms that govern new technology to ensure we benefit while maintaining our security and freedoms and to ensure that countries work together on tackling the biggest global challenges. That's overarching. Number two, in all these efforts, collective action with our allies and partners will be vitally important. And the review rightly reaffirms the UK's commitment, and I quote, to working with our European partners and to our collective Euro-Atlantic security through NATO. And it makes a commitment to pragmatic cooperation with the EU where our interests coincide, highlighting, for example, in supporting the stability and security of our continent, as well as cooperating on climate change and biodiversity, to name but a few. The third quote is about our European neighbors, and the report says that our European neighbors and allies remain vital partners. The UK will be the greatest single European contributor to the security of the Euro-Atlantic area until 2030. We will work with our partners to defend our common values, to counter shared threats, to build resilience in our neighborhood. And we will also sustain our people and cultural ties and look for opportunities to collaborate, including in developing green technology, and through a green recovery from COVID-19. And then the final quote I would highlight is the UK will also work with allies, like-minded partners and civil society worldwide to protect democratic values. And this is as part of our force for good agenda. And in many instances, this will involve working bilaterally with countries to strengthen domestic governance and to build their resistance and resilience to threats and hazards. And in doing so, Quote, we will focus our efforts primarily in the wider European neighborhood. So in a sentence, the way I would kind of bring that all together uh, and epitomize it uh, as to what it really means for our work in the Western Balkans is by saying that we are willing and intending to use political and program tools in an agile way to broker deals. And I would highlight, for example, our work on Prespa and in Mostar and Bosnia-Herzegovina, which Matt will talk about, to broker deals, to convey tough messages, to work with partners on both sides of the Atlantic, to take actions in defense of our values, and to lead the change we want to see on areas such as rule of law, international justice, corruption and meritocracy, treatment of minorities, and gender representation. Now, I'm going to come on now to the European context, which I'm sure a lot of you will be interested to, to know our stance on. And this really replies, I think, most to your question, Karina, at the start. And what I would say about this is that since our decision to leave the EU, people have queried whether we can credibly advocate for other countries to join. This was a big question at our Western Balkan summit in London, and it's seen by some as a bit of a paradox. I think it became less of a paradox after our summit after we had acted on the commitment we gave by scaling up our programming and our footprint of UK-based staff working in the region on security. But we do still hear the argument 
sometimes in Brussels, sometimes in the region, sometimes elsewhere, that the UK would no longer care about the Western Balkans and about European integration of the Western Balkans after we'd left the EU. And I want to rebut that firmly. Not the case. The UK interests I set out right at the start, why the Balkans matter to the UK, have not changed. And uh, we want to see continued progress of the Western Balkans countries towards Euro-Atlantic integration. Euro-Atlantic integration best serves our aims in the region, just as much now as it did for our EU exit for the Western Balkans countries. We support it from outside the EU now, so do the Americans. And like them, we also remain active and important force contributors within NATO and influential in the UN Security Council, as well as in other international organizations. And we see progress towards Euro-Atlantic ambitions of the Western Balkan Six as their sovereign choice of their governments and indeed of the people who have elected them. And we support them in that sovereign choice. Very important point. We believe the most effective way to pursue our UK vision for the Balkans, which I set out, is by working effectively with our most important, influential, like-minded international partners. And who do I mean by that? In the case of the Western Balkans, that is primarily the EU institutions and like-minded European countries and partners, particularly those in the Quint and the Americans. And it also includes obviously pro-enlargement EU member states, but it also includes, I would say, not just the Europeans and the Americans, uh, but the IFIs, the international organizations active in the world, in the, in the Western Balkans, like the UN and the OSCE uh, and the Council of Europe, and indeed regional organizations that we still work closely with, uh, like the RCC and within it, the IISG. So in short, by collaborating and co-financing program work with other donors, we believe we can often amplify what we're aiming to achieve, deliver more of the change we want to see, and now that we have increased programming, although it's not the largest in volume by any means, that allows us to respond quickly at scale to new opportunities. Our technical assistance is well known for its agility. And we want to make sure that our spending is complementary to the EU's huge spending, which of course we can't compete with or compare with. And indeed with that of the IFIs and other major donors. And we also want to provide support in a way that will build, bring benefits to the citizens of the Western Balkans. And our main aim there is to achieve transformational citizen-focused reform in support of citizens' aspirations in making progress towards EU accession for which they voted. So such reform sometimes may require a longer term perspective and indeed risk appetite. So not all existing institutions in the Western Balkans may always like it. For instance, our support for independent media. But we want to help to deliver what the citizens of the Western Balkans really want to improve their lives and prospects, not what we think they should want. And we support courageous reformers with that in mind. And the best way we can add our value, we believe, is by taking advantage of our UK areas of strength or expertise. And I want to run quickly through those before I finish. We see these as, if you like, equities that we have to offer. We want to present them as opportunities to our partners to work with. We don't see them as uh, bids to compete or to counteract. And my top 10 would be these. Historic involvement in the Western Balkans, in conflicts, peace agreements, post-conflict transition. Our activist role as a friend, and when necessary, an honest and critical friend since then. The political heavy lifting that we can bring and deep understanding and expertise in the region to intractable disputes or political blockages, often in partnership with our Quint partners. Uh, fourthly, our willingness to tackle uh, malign influence, uh, including publicly when justified uh, at political and program levels, often in a way that others are not. Fifthly, we are perceived in the region as continuing to be a champion of the Western Balkan Six Euro Atlantic perspective for reasons I've mentioned. Sixth, we continue to help shape the wider international community's policy towards the Balkans, including through the Berlin process, and this year our leadership in the G7 and on COP26. Seventh, we have an active role in military and civilian missions, providing security, and we're active supporters of the Western Balkan countries' NATO aspirations. Uh, next, we have an important voice in the IFIs, the World Bank, the IMF, the EBRD, uh, as well as in uh, the World Health Organization, World Trade Organization, which are of course of growing significance as the Western Balkan Six are looking to build back better after the coronavirus. Uh, ninth, we have an agile, adaptable aid and technical assistance program focused on conflict prevention, reconciliation, combating serious and organized crime and corruption and violent extremism. 
And finally, 10th, we continue to be a force for good in the world, and particularly in the Western Balkans, as set out in the integrated review, including on legacy issues uh, that not everybody has the appetite to tackle. And I mentioned messing persons and war crimes and PSVI. Now, many other countries, it's fair to say, uh, in a few cases, um, you know, have pretty well all of these strengths, but um, not many combine them all as we do, aligned to the historical record that we have. So in conclusion, on a personal note, if I may, when I took on this job in September 2018, I saw it as my main responsibility to implement the pledges which our ministers had made at the London summit through our EU exit and beyond, and I still do. And I expected that there would be bumps along the way during and after our EU exit, and there have been some, but I've hugely appreciated as a diplomat how much my European and American counterparts and others have wanted to work closely with the UK on the Western Balkans throughout this period, right into 2021 and the present day, just as I wanted to continue to do with them and where possible strengthen our collaboration in policy and program areas where our interests coincide. And there are logical reasons for our continuing to work constructively together on the Western Balkans, given the big challenges the region still faces. And so it may be aspirational, even naive, but my goal in 2021 is to do all I can with my colleagues in FCDO, Whitehall, our six posts in the region and others, to make our joint work with our European and American partners in particular, a shining example of what strong foreign security and development policy collaboration can be like in a vital region after our exit from the EU. And I believe it's in our common interests to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Page. Um, quite clearly, there is no question uh, of the UK withdrawing from the region, if I understood you correctly, that too much has already been invested. And of course, there is uh, too much at stake also in the, in the future uh, for the UK uh, in the Balkans. However, uh, what I do want to uh, ask you as a quick follow-up, um, how easy do you think that it will be to forge this collective action and to work together with European partners, as you've um, uh, told us, um, to work together in, in the Balkans in order to uh, achieve Britain's strategic goal, um, goal or goals over there, uh, from given that the UK is not outside um, the, the, the Union? I'll be really frank with you, Corinna. To be honest, I don't notice where I sit. Currently, it's in Sussex, not in London, but I hope to go back to the capital soon. I don't notice a great difference. And if anything, I, in my job, have probably intensified and stepped up the amount of contact I've had with my Quint counterparts, including the Americans, and uh, also contacts in the region because it's been done virtually. And uh, Previously, we used to meet three times a year in person. Now I'm on the phone to them very often. And I also know that our colleagues who work very hard in Brussels are in very regular contact with our European partners there too, as indeed are our colleagues in our Western Balkan six embassies, our embassies in the region, and you'll be hearing from our ambassador to BIH very shortly. So uh, certainly on the policy and on the programming side, that very close collaboration continues. I don't see any reason why it shouldn't. I think it's in our common interest to do so. Um, we've also been very active in supporting Mr. Lychak since he was appointed, uh, because it's very much in all our interest to see progress on the Serbia-Kosovo dialogue. We've got a lot of expertise that we want to bring to bear, as have other countries in the Quint, and he's got a vital role. And ultimately, I think the support of the Quint countries will help in what he's trying to achieve. So I don't see very much diminution. All right. I'm, I'm sure we can come back to, um, uh, to that issue um, a bit later. I would now like to turn to um, uh, Ambassador Field and, um, and ask him, how does this approach that we've just heard translate more concretely in the Balkan countries and how is it perceived on the ground in the region? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks very much, Corinna. Um, Andrew has covered much of this, and we've got two more, two great speakers to follow. So, so I, I'll be pretty, pretty brief. First of all, happy St. Patrick's Day to everyone. Um, just to briefly explain, so you know, my my career started in Zagreb, working in the UK embassy there. Just at the moment, the UK lifted its veto um, uh, regarding ICTY cooperation. I saw the new sort of accession process benchmarking opening, closing chapters, all of that um, up close uh, in Zagreb. And then I moved 
actually on an EU secondment to Skopje where I was looking at things like the operative framework agreement implementation. Uh, this was early Gorevsky, so before all the statues started popping up, um, but seeing the process there away from the region, then returning and working for the USR in Sarajevo to head up the political work, actually just one month after the uh, UK referendum. So quite an interesting time there for a couple of years before starting as ambassador here. So I think just quickly, Karina, I mean, the, the, the question about why, why we care, the sort of commonality of purpose here, I think it's just worth saying again, this is, this is a question of proximity for both of us. Um, this is not outside of Europe. This is within Europe. Um, in the Western Balkans. I think High Rep Mogherini put it very well. She said, actually, this is not an enlargement project. This is a unification project. And I think that proximity shows that when the risks for us, transiting drugs, weapons, people, those weaknesses affect us at home. And that, that's a, a common and shared uh, uh, concern. Um, yes, the legacy, as Andrew was mentioning, all the, the investments that we've made, creating some of these institutions, particularly in a place like Bosnia. Um, but I think that also means we have a responsibility to make them work. Um, uh, will live with the consequences of their failure. This is a contested space as well, I think it's worth saying. So that Euro-Atlantic perspective is important precisely because others want this function, to, this region to be dysfunctional, to perpetuate that fragility. And that's not in our interest, either of us. And then lastly, more positively, um, I think precisely the diversity of this region of a country like Bosnia is, is the opportunity, it's the strength. You know, this, this is an opportunity within this kind of greater battle of ideas, frankly, between those who believe different people cannot live together and those who believe they can. And I think that's why we need this region and a country like Bosnia to succeed. Just quickly then, sort of view from the ground, a bit on how we're doing, but on what, what cooperation looks like. How are we doing? Uh, frankly, I think we're not doing well. Um, uh, not doing well enough. Uh, I don't think this is a country or region on the brink of a major security deterioration, but Progress is very slow. Um, corrupt elites are very comfortable and people are voting with their feet. And you can see this here in Sarajevo, the visa lines outside the German, Austrian, Slovenian embassies. Young people are choosing the EU, but they're not waiting or willing to wait for the EU to get to this country. Um, and with that, of course, you lose those drives of change, those entrepreneurs, those future leaders. So, you know, we ask them why they are leaving. And the themes that keep coming up are rule of law, corruption, quality of public services, frustration with the sort of politics of division, which then I think gives us our checklist of what we should be doing together. Um, what does this look like on the ground, this kind of cooperation? Um, again, th this, is, this is not about contesting the EU agenda, the primacy of the EU agenda. It's one thing that everyone here agrees on. I think our role um, as the UK, particularly is to sort of support and reinforce because we have the same interest in a stable, prosperous, inclusive Bosnia and Herzegovina. I think the challenge, particularly these days, is that the finish line is very far off. Um, uh, now, we don't have a position, a, a voice in that room. We shouldn't be involved in that discussion. Uh, but the questions about the timing and that pace of progress, um, that means that there, there is an impatience amongst the populace. And I think that means focusing on uh, what, what improvements now will in, affect the country, not just about that finish line, what we do it because of Brussels tells us to more about we do it because it's the right thing to do now. I mean, Bosnia is uniquely complicated. Um, it has uh, perhaps the most complicated political system in the world, but actually the fundamental underlying challenges are very familiar from any country in transition, particularly corruption. And that's where we really have a common interest in, in working together. Uh, values matter, they will make us distinct from um, other competitors in the region, so uh, promotion and inclusion, speaking up against uh, attacks on women in public life, things like that, that's part of what we can do together. But really the UK contribution, um, I would hope, for the reasons that Andrew said, you know, on a good day it's, it's bringing together our policy programme, our political expertise, um, all behind that. Um, one word on the programme side, Andrew said about agility, you know, EPA, instrument pre-accession in the region, uh, is a bit of an oil tanker. I know it's, it's very large and, and um, uh, not necessarily able to change directions. So what we've been able to do sometimes is to make the short, uh, quick interventions that will help to unlock those, those bigger programs of support. We use our voice speaking up in the PIC as we do um, uh, in the UN Security Council. You know, we, we can bring together these different elements. Um, again, 
combined, united um, in that purpose. So lastly, what next? Um, and I really do want to hear more. I see we've got questions already. I really do want to hear more of the thoughts from Sonada and Miriam and, and the questions that people have got. But what next, briefly? I think the most important thing for me here is, is about unity of purpose. Uh, so that unity of those that have the best interests of this country, this region at heart, but also a division of labour. So we don't all have to be doing the same thing all the time. And depending on the subject, I mentioned the Quint a lot, um, on other areas, for example, it might be Sweden, uh, on uh, environment, um, it might be uh, Switzerland on local government. Uh, we have partners in the UN, the OSC here. That sort of division of labour, that collaboration is very important. Secondly, I think it's worth being explicit. You know, our agenda here is by and large one of getting turkeys to vote for Christmas. Um, so we are trying to remove the structures um, uh, which allow an elite to remain in place in order for citizens to, to uh, fulfill uh, everything that they want to achieve in this country. And for many leaders in this region, frankly, they have seen the image of former Prime Minister Sanada in handcuffs. And that is part of the challenge is that they see where those reforms can lead. So focus on the rule of law. Um, it matters to the member states, it matters to the EU institutions, and it matters to citizens here. So rule of law is rightly put at the centre of what we're trying to do. I do notice, I have to say, that some of those closing benchmarks that Croatia was asked to achieve then are now being asked much earlier, so Bosnia for candidate status. So that has been brought forward, but that's the priority that is set by citizens as well. Last two things. I think there's a particular challenge around bilateral disagreements in this region. So there's a number of um, issues between the members of the Western Balkan Six and also members of the Six with, um, with member states as well. And I think how we tackle some of those bilateral dis disagreements, um, commitments that many of these countries have made in the Berlin process, but that working together um, and working particularly with the US, I think in terms of how we, we move ahead through those bilateral disagreements, we do have some good examples, I think PRESPA being one of them, but there are more of those challenges ahead. And then lastly, I think it's really important. There's a perception that um, we are on the side of the elite, the politicians. And we need to make sure in what we're doing, we are empowering citizens and especially young people. I think we have that same common instinct, those common values. We do it by promoting transparency, promoting media freedom, um, uh, the sort of civic society as well. But we have to make sure that we are helping citizens to hold their representatives to account, not doing their job for them. Thank you. I'm going to pass back. Who has this Thanks. perception? So I think, um, uh, frankly, I think a lot of people um, believe that, uh, and yet Sanada is agreeing with me. I think it's a popular view that, that the international community or, or active uh, partners here are focused on politicians. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important that we not have that default. I think in practice, certainly the UK has tried very hard. I see other partners trying to do this as well focus on young people for the reasons that I said. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who are leaving and they're the ones that we need to either return or to stay to drive that change for a successful country and region. Thank you. Um, I wanted you to specify it because um, uh, I want to, to, to ask you, how do political leaders and also um, citizens in the Balkan countries perceive this continued or indeed reinforced commitment of the UK in the region? So I think, you know, quite rightly, the question that I often get, not only about EU exit, what does it mean? But okay, these, these are fine words, but what does it look like in practice? What have you done for us lately? So we have really tried in an embassy like this in Sarajevo to take those additional staff and funds that Andrew has mentioned, to make sure we're coordinated with others, but to make sure that we're really adding value in the right places. And frankly, that means talking to citizens more and listening more listening more to the things that will improve their lives now. So, you know, very practical terms, working on things like public services, improving the way that money is spent, reducing the very large public sector here, a lot of it, especially through state-owned companies, things like that, which in increasing transparency, digitalizing more public services, things like that, that I think are more tangible um, to citizens than just talking about uh, sort of the principles um, Ultimately, we're judged on the actions, not on the words. 
Absolutely. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, I would now like to turn to Ms. Lexman. I hope she's still with us. Um, Ms. Lexman? Yeah. Um, yeah. And just ask you, how, how do you see the UK's intention uh, to remain invested uh, in the Western Balkan countries? Thank you very much. First of all, thank you for the invitation to this very timely and very important topic. It's the cooperation between the EU and the UK, not only in the Balkans, but I would say that the, our cooperation is very vital in many different areas of foreign policy, security and defence. And I would uh, maybe start with the words of Prime Minister Johnson, who said that the UK has left the European Union, but not, not Europe. And I think within the context, it's very good to look at, at our current discussion, but also the other issues related to foreign affairs and, and foreign engagement and security and defence. Uh, I, I also um, think that what Ambassador Field said, that uh, we are not talking, when, when talking about Western Balkans and the ambition of the European Union, uh, and if it's whether it's compatible with the ambition of the UK, I think really the phrasing that we are not talking about enlargement, but we are talking about unification is really the context within with which we can look into our cooperation in the Western Balkans. Uh, I think that uh, it was great to hear from Mr. Page uh, the, that the cooperation practically continues, that uh, on a daily level, people responsible for policy, policies in the Western Balkans are communicating and coordinating their efforts. And here I would say that I think what is, uh, what is what should be our ambition of the EU, but also the UK, not only related to the Western Balkans, but our future cooperation is that we are, we will be looking for a clear structure, I don't mean organizational structure, but the way how we are going to cooperate in general on foreign affairs, defense and, and security issues. And I, I think I really like the idea that the UK should be invited to foreign affairs councils as an observer, because I really believe that the coordination is absolutely vital for the, for, for the I would say, the democratic perspective of uh, an our engagement uh, in the global affairs, which are becoming more and more challenge challenging. And, and, and I also regret that practically the security area of cooperation was really left out and there is no clear line how we are going to cooperate in terms of security and defense outside of NATO, obviously. And I think that we need to find ways how to strengthen the cooperation in general, because this is not related only to Western Balkans. It was already mentioned by all, both of the previous speakers that the security area is absolutely vital for the Western Balkans, but this is vital for, for us to be able to, to strengthen uh, our efforts and our values in the global world. And here also it comes the cooperation with the, with our American partners and the, and the general transatlantic cooperation. I would say that with this, I think what is absolutely vital is that uh, uh, for the Western Balkans, we are, first of all, as it was already said, uh, trying to coordinate within the transatlantic cooperation. So not only between the EU and the UK, because of course we know that there is a the uh, the US is strongly involved in the region, is trying also to support the development of the region, the democratic processes, the reform processes in the region, as well as strengthening the, the security and defense capacity of the region. So I believe that the cooperation of all these three partners must be strengthened. Uh, when it comes to uh, democracy and rule of law, this con continues to be the priority of the European Union as well. I would just mention uh, we had just uh, in the Foreign Affairs, uh, Foreign Affairs uh, um, uh, Committee in the European Parliament, we just had a hearing with, uh, with Jerzy Pomianowski, the director of the European Endowment for Democracy, where he actually thanked the UK, that the UK continues to be a great supporter of the endowment and through the endowment also supports the democratic processes and civil society in the region, which I think is a great example of uh, continued cooperation, which has already been started within the EU. Then uh, our 
other issues we need to look into is uh, is the the support of the economic performance of the region because obviously we know that poverty brings vulnerable vulnerability uh, to rule of law to democracy but also uh, makes the region vulnerable through to uh, foreign actors like russia and china i'll come back to that but i think that the strengthening of the economic performance is one of the areas where the eu and uk must look uh, into cohesion and, and supporting each other's project. Uh, the European Commission has just launched an economic uh, investment plan for the Western Balkans, where Commission Varhe has pledged that there will be, uh, I mean, it might mobilize uh, funds of 9 billion euros for the region for supporting in transport, energy, green and digital transition and and thus successful integration processes and democratization processes. And I believe this is something where we definitely need to coordinate our steps and, and seek our uh, synergy uh, in, in, terms of this, uh, in, in terms of this plan. Uh, I would mention two uh, more points where I believe that we need to really strengthen our cooperation. And uh, one is security and security uh, also in terms of uh, um, limiting the, the dependency, especially in terms of strate strategic infrastructure of the Western Balkans from Russia and China, because we all know that this is a danger for the region. And we all know that we are failing to stop this tendency that practically these countries of the Western Balkans are becoming more and more dependent from Russia and China, Russian and Chinese investment, Although the EU and the UK together and the US, uh, we are bringing much more funding, but I believe that we need to really secure that the strategic infrastructure is not being captured by China and Russia. And this is not only uh, related to security issues, but this is also related to all the other efforts in the region, which is environmental uh, changes, uh, where we try to bring the countries closer to our environmental uh, um, strategy to improve the environmental uh, performance and also this is also related to labor law which obviously these investors usually uh, undermine the, the, the security of of uh, of the uh, workforce uh, for their being guaranteed their rights and uh, i mean i would maybe just mention one one example where uh, i have sent a letter i coordinated a letter and asked my colleagues from the european parliament to co-sign we are looking at the situation in serbia where there are lots of chinese investment uh, coming in uh, investment into heavy industry which is not only uh, increasing the strategic dependency and the strategic risk but is also damaging the environment is also uh, uh, damaging the the labor uh, standards uh, or undermining the labor standards in the country and I think this is something we really need to look into and we cannot kind of uh, pass it but that we have uh, good plans with the country but we need to look at the loopholes where we are failing because usually these can actually completely undermine our our efforts our investments our um, our programs and and this is what we need to strengthen our efforts to to really look into the loopholes and fill them in and the final thing i would uh, i would mention is uh, related to uh, this information and and the public kind of influence of the public uh, opinions in the in those countries of the western balkans because here again we are absolutely failing Despite of the fact that the UK and the EU is coming with far more money, far more funding, far more support, we are not seen as the main actors by the population because of the very strategic, uh, I would say, campaigns of uh, Russia, which we already know for some time. But I would also look into China because uh, the Chinese approach to uh, to, to the ways how to, to manipulate the public opinion is maybe mo not so easily to detect, but it's definitely there. And we could look into it also from the, when we look into the public uh, opinion polls, where we, we see that uh, China and Chinese investments are seen as a very positive by the, by the general public, which I think that this is uh, something which comes out from the way how the Chinese are able to promote uh, their uh, support 
<laughs> their cooperation and rather than we are failing there. So I will stop here. I just try to kind of open a couple of uh, issues, but I'm also looking forward to the questions and further discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I was just wondering, I mean, we speak of uh, collective action and of cooperation and, and, and to a certain extent or and to a large extent, that means uh, shoring up support from both sides behind uh, certain initiatives and, um, and, and certain goals that the uh, EU and the uh, UK share for the region. However, uh, collaboration could also mean a division of labor so that each side can contribute in areas and in respect which um, um, build on their um, um, potential to bring an added value um, to the countries of the region. And so uh, in, that, in, in this sense, the UK and the EU's approach um, could also differ uh, simply because we bo both sides understand that um, uh, there are different issues that the uh, that they can bring to the table for those countries and and so what how do you think that a division of labor from from this point of view could look like and and more generally when it comes to cooperation with the uk um who do you think in the eu uh, should be responsible for taking this forward more concretely and filling in some of the gaps um, in a more formal manner uh, henceforth. Thank you very much. Um, I think the division of labor is something we can look into kind of longer uh, time, but at, at this moment it's very difficult because obviously UK has also to set first its own ways of approaching the Western Balkans and its own priorities. Uh, because so far we had the kind of joint approaches, obviously, I mean, the, the foreign foreign uh, uh, ministry and foreign office had its own programs, but now, I mean, being outside of the EU, obviously many things are being changed and shaken. So I think uh, it's very difficult to talk about clear division of labor. What I think, what we need to talk about, it's a rather exchange of information on a daily basis between those people who are relevant uh, for, the, for making the uh, uh, kind of daily decisions or the strategic decisions which are related and shaping the policies towards uh, Western Balkans. Uh, and I, I believe that uh, the division of labor can come out of uh, this e uh, intensive exchange for, for some time. So I think I would start there. But as I said at the very beginning, that what I believe it's it, very important is that we are not only kind of um, uh, we don't have the exchange of uh, information and uh, and uh, cooperation on the level of the of the I would say administrative part. But what we need is absolutely the le the political level, where as I mentioned, is the the foreign affairs councils. I mean, we definitely need something which the political cooperation will, will when we will be overseeing that there will be a will from the policy side or political leader side that, that the cooperation is there and that, that, that we are looking for synergies in the region and I think this if there is a clear yes from the political side then of course I mean on the administrative side these answers will be found very easily thank you or much more easily thank you thank you very much um Last but certainly not least, I come to Senada. Um, you are an expert on the Balkan region, but also on EU enlargement policy. Um, what do you make of these official views that we've just heard? Thank you, Corina. Um, first, greetings to everybody. I'm happy to be on this uh, great panel and uh, greetings to our participants uh, also. A lot has been said. Um, regarding the expectations and what what are the um, um, desires and plans for um, uh, future cooperation between the UK and the EU uh, in the Western Balkans, but um, we are only starting, so there is not not much to be said in terms of what are the tangible results. So I think we will um, know better as time passes and we see how uh, in um, how the cooperation takes place, what uh, our processes in these countries, how the EU is 
changing, what the UK is um, 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 making out of the uh, Brexit uh, uh, process and so on. Uh, however, to underline what Andrew and Matt said in terms of the historical legacy and the I would say the capital invested in terms not only uh, uh, capital as uh, financial, but uh, capital in terms of political uh, and security engagement so far, I would say that the UK stands well in all of the countries in the Western Balkans, in some more, in some less, but you can only follow the, the statements, blogs that ambassadors write and they find their way in the local media. It's uh, it is perceived and, and recognized as having a, a voice. Uh, so I think this is the capital that uh, uh, can be sustained uh, because the investment has already been made. It's not building a new relationship. The relationship already exists. So how can this be exploited in a way that really contributes contributes to more meaningful change uh, in the Western Balkans. It has been said by my by previous speakers, I will only underline again that the EU perspective, and you mentioned EU enlargement as much as we would like to see a uh, faster pace of reforms in these countries to join the European Union. Uh, there, is not, there is not much desire I'm speaking about all countries, but of course, there are some political leaders that are committed to, to reforms. But in general, we see authoritarian tendencies and low pace of reforms in these countries, and therefore not genuine desire to, to change. Uh, while at the same time, we have the EU um, focused on its own internal uh, challenges. So uh, I don't want certainly to sound pessimistic, but I think it is realistic to say that this is going to be a very, very long process. And who knows when and if these countries will join the European Union. So what can and should be done in the meantime? The security element is certainly important and uh, probably will be uh, um, a strong uh, focus of the UK. I see that as a NATO member and uh, having the interest, I mean, geography matters. And the UK may start to build relationships with Asia and, and uh, some other parts of the world, but still this is Europe and proximity is, is important. So really what happens in the Balkans impacts the, the European uh, continent at large. Um, the uh, how to how to support the um, uh, Matt said that these leaders don't have genuine desire and mentioned us another uh, example in syndrome. I see, for example, I would like to see the UK being more uh, vocal in criticizing uh, policies or or uh, uh, situations in these countries that are not in line with desirable reforms with liberal democracy, with uh, stronger democratic institutions, and may even use sanctions. Uh, probably as uh, with the EU has more difficulty in reaching unanimous decision in sanctioning some of the politicians. But the US has been uh, using this instrument and uh, perhaps the UK can also decide to show that it has position and is willing to uh, raise stakes and sanction some of the politicians that are violating these principles, values and norms that we speak about. Um, the, uh, I just read this morning um, a GITOC report on the uh, civil society performance in the Western Balkans on fighting corruption and organized crime. And the report finds that out of 100,000 CSOs in the Balkans, 1% actually works on fighting corruption and organized crime. While at the same time, we see this as one of the major uh, challenges and, and major impediments to, to reform. So uh, my desire would be to see the UK uh, together with partners uh, in the international community, it can be the EU, it can be some countries in the EU, it can be the US, in strengthening judiciary transparency and stronger uh, judicial institutions, because uh, 
the uh, rule of law is not only important for protecting human rights and democratic standards, it's important for the economic development. No investor will come in a, a legally challenged uh, a country, maybe speculative capital, but this is not the developmental capital. So in that sense, uh, we kill two birds with one shot, so to speak, if we strengthen the, the uh, rule of law. And then this brings me back, this is my final point on how to engage with citizens as actually being the ones who suffer from the lack of uh, functionality in their countries, of the lack of development, and therefore decide to leave because they face the situation in which they can't simply find a way how to elect new leaders. I mean, I'm not saying some citizens probably vote for the parties they want to see in power, but we have seen a lot of election fraud. We have seen lots of uh, um, uh, pressure on people to, to vote in a certain way, media, uh, lack of media freedom, and so on and so on. And uh, uh, I think we need to disintegrate the CSO support, so civil society organizations from really citizens in the field. We had the situation of Justice for David, for example, movement in Bosnia-Herzegovina, which was crushed by political uh, um, leadership in Republika Srpska. Uh, we, we see environmental uh, activist groups who fight for, um, you know, against um, um, corrupt concessions uh, for hydropower plants, for example. Um, there are youth initiatives. Um, gender uh, initiatives. These are all the ways that uh, and, and um, groups in society that can be emboldened and strengthened. But this is only one part of the picture. Uh, capacity building is good exercise. But if it doesn't help if the structure remains the same. So I think the bigger even uh, contribution from the international community and not to be seen as partnering the elected authoritarian officials who do not have a desire to work for the public good, but only to stay in power, would be to try to uh, change the rules of the game, so to speak, through the ju judiciary, strengthening the rule of law through conditioning the, the assistance, the financial assistance that, that uh, they received. Miriam spoke about the EU, a large uh, 9 billion uh, euro package for the, for the Western Balkans. This uh, needs to be conditioned more strictly to performance from, from uh, the uh, governments uh, in, in the region. And uh, if we manage to change somewhat the rules of the game, which currently favor elected politicians, let's have other players play. And if these guys win again uh, on the basis of new rules, then it's the responsibility is also on the citizens. But at the moment, we have the system that favors those who are in power and uh, strengthening judiciary, rule of law, and these uh, uh, citizens groups that genuinely work for their communities, in my opinion, is the best way forward. Thank you very much, uh, Senada. Um, I want to, because we have 30 minutes left uh, from, uh, from our meeting, I want to encourage uh, um, our participants to raise their hand and ask questions if, um, uh, if they have questions for our speakers. We already have collected five uh, queries uh, in written, but uh, it would be great also to see some hands um, up and uh, actually hear uh, the, the representatives of, uh, of the audience so we don't have the impression that we are alone here. Um, in the meantime, um, if I may, um, Senada, um, so how do you think that, uh, because we've mentioned a lot the rule of law, judiciary, organized crime, all these uh, uh, issues linked to um, uh, the uh, democratic pillar of the EU's conditionality. Um, how do you think the UK can actually achieve successes um, in an area where the EU has been struggling and uh, has been pushing for 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 so long um, 
What does the UK have to offer to the region in this regard that the EU doesn't? Can I go first? Is that a question? I can't hear you. It was, uh, a, question. It was a question for Senator as a quick follow up because she insisted oh, a I'm lot sorry. on. But, but um, of course, you're welcome. Let, to let Andrew uh, uh, and say also what Andrew, he wants. Yeah. Sure. You go first, Senator. Sorry to chip in. But go ahead, Andrew, if you want. Ladies first. Okay, I will. Uh, it is it is uh, obviously a huge huge problem, um, but uh, I mentioned sanctions. I really mentioned some uh, uh, direct uh, policy uh, measures that uh, uh, will change the perception that you know the international community is the same and that they have very big mechanism for how to change this. So one is this, the second one is um, 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 tying, uh, and this would be in collaboration with the European Union, which is investing huge funds in uh, tying assistance to really very tangible um, um, achievements that need to be evaluated before uh, further assistance is offered. It doesn't make sense that the EU sits and complains that other actors are finding their way or taking advantage of uh, the European um, um, area of interest, being that the Western Balkans, while the EU should recognize that it is still the strongest actor in terms of the economic cooperation, trade, investment, the EU gives grants, other actors do not, China never gives grants. So it's, it's, it's really surprising to me to see the EU complaining about these other actors when they are only exploiting the EU's weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And the EU, uh, if it is serious about wanting the Western Balkans in its club, should find a way to, to find really partners on the ground who have the same goal, because it's waste of time, energy, resources, and even in, you know, insulting intelligence to keep saying that we expect the leaders to change their policy when they don't want to, because it's not in their interest. So who are the partners and who should be genuinely supported, I think is the question that needs to be asked from those uh, on the part of the European Union. Thank you very much, Senator. Um, I will give the floor to Mr. Page if he still wants to respond. Uh, and I will add um, at least uh, uh, the first set of questions, which comes from uh, Ryan Sherba. Uh, uh, from the Balkan Insider, he's asking um, about what unique opportunities are there for bilateral US-UK cooperation? That would be one. And the second, um, if you could tell us how the change from uh, Foreign Commonwealth Office to Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office coupled with Brexit is granting the UK more flexibility in the region. So I will add those into the mix and then we'll go on. Very good. Well, if I might to divide those up, I will take the point about corruption and uh, also about sanctions, which has come up. And I might ask Matt to handle the one about Brexit and FCDO. And, and on UK-US, we might both answer that, I think. Um, my answer really is partly about sanctions, actually. But just first of all on corruption, I just wanted to restate one of the points I made in my opening remarks about uh, one of the things we did at our summit, which was to secure anti-corruption pledges from all Western Balkan six leaders. I think that was important. They were all tailored to their own country. They were different based on the methodology we'd used on a corruption summit in London in 2015. And I want to give one example of how that's worked well for us since in Kosovo, where we have uh, been seen, I think, locally in a way as market leaders in our program work on anti-corruption in Kosovo by having a flagship project which ensures meritocratic recruitment to top jobs in government. And it's resulted in what we consider something of a sea change in senior appointments, which include director of police, director of prisons, director of customs. And we've created more of a national conversation that puts pressure on leaders to reverse state capture. 
Now, I think since we've had the election of Betvin Dossier, who will soon be forming the government, that is something to which Alvin Kurti, certainly according to his manifesto, is very strongly committed to, rooting out nepotism at senior management levels. So I think that's one example of where one can take active steps as a donor. On uh, the US-UK, I would back up what Sonata just said a moment ago about sanctions. Uh, the key point there, I think, is that we now have a UK autonomous sanctions policy since we've left the EU. It's mentioned in our integrated review and the words they say there are departure from the EU means we can move more quickly than through multilateral channels when it's in our interest to do so, while continuing to coordinate closely with like-minded partners. And we've already demonstrated the agility of our autonomous sanctions policy in September last year, when we were the first European country to announce sanctions against the leader of Belarus. Now, I'm not saying that there will be sanctions necessary in the Balkans, but we have that capacity, should we choose. And I know that the Americans, Matt Palmer, my opposite number, is very interested to talk to us about whether that might bring us closely or more closely into alignment with where the Americans are uh, on sanctions policy. I'll stop there and I'll let Matt pick, pick up the baton. Yes, and if I can just add to the questions for uh, the ambassador, um, a question that was raised by Valentina Granovic uh, from University of Bologna and policy researcher at Vocal Europe. She's asking, do you think it will be a great opportunity to rebuild the image of the office of the high representative in Bosnian, Bosnia and Herzegovina society? Um, yes, whether the, the new high representative uh, is, is an opportunity for, uh, for, for Bosnia. Sure. Uh, let, let me jump in on the first bit, the, the US, UK, a little bit FCDO, and then I'll pick up that, that good question from Valentina. Um, I mean, just on the US, UK, you know, part of it is, is how much we are doing already together and will continue to do. You know, there's no need for the US and UK to operate solely bilaterally in many of these areas. And I'm glad you mentioned in the question the OSC there, because I think the OSC, which is actually a huge footprint in Bosnia and across the region, as one of the very few genuine field presences these days in all parts of the country. You know, the OSC has a lot to contribute there, particularly around sort of security issues, the rule of law. So, and yeah, that's good. One, one thing where the US and UK do have a particular uh, interest and lead, I think, is around NATO. Um, this is a region which has uh, you know, three, several members inside the alliance, um, and uh, even Bosnia, where you know, this is a contentious issue, the question about a longer term perspective of membership. Bosnia is already contributing um, to NATO missions around the world uh, and is planning to do more. And we have a sort of mantra in mind that you know, ultimately what we're hoping for is to see the Western Balkans not as an importer of security, as in peacekeeping missions coming in, but actually as an exporter of security. And you can see those, those contributors around the world and that expertise. Already you see um, uh, police officers on international missions, uh, soldiers on peacekeeping duty, things like that. So more of that. And I think us, we in the, U, the US have, have a strong view on that. On the change from FCO to FCDO, I've got to be completely honest, Ryan, and say that's not very made, made very much difference for us in this region. Uh, we did not have DFID beforehand, so we have not had sort of an integration process. We were already one embassy team, and we actually have programs which are quite large and, as I've said, quite agile, and that's been part of our USP. We, we benefit at headquarters, I think, from having more integration there um, and you know, speaking with a single voice. But I think that has not had such an impact here. I think the, the court sort of cross government, you know, I have six, I think seven different government departments inside the embassy in Sarajevo. And that sort of speaks to this kind of cross government approach that we have um, already. Just quickly on Valentina's point um, uh, about the high representative and, and Bosnia, and I'll try not to make this too much just for the Bosnia watchers, but this is, I think, you know, a really important discussion at the moment about the future of the office of the high rep. Um, Germany wants to introduce an, a new high rep as part of, uh, they would say, a push to refocus on the region and, and on Bosnia in particular. I think the really critical thing is that this is a joined up uh, approach across all of those members here of the Peace Implementation Council, but it's contested. It's absolutely part of that contested space that I talked about. Um, and certainly there are plenty of voices, especially from Moscow, very explicit that they think it's time to close this office we think that closure only happens on the basis of progress being achieved. 
that's the condition for moving ahead. And I think that's a position which a lot of, frankly, a lot of people in this country also agree with. So without wanting to be too specific about that process, just to say, I think the, the key question that we've got to come back to is, um, is the country moving forwards and making that progress and what more can we do collectively to support that progress? Corinna, you want to come back? No, I, I actually wanted to add because uh, it fits in with uh, with what you were saying. Nicholas White uh, was uh, was asking precisely that. Given that the hard security threat is over, is it now time to work out an exit strategy for the high representative so that Bosnians are fully responsible for their own state and institutions? I just wanted to bring in his voice. As well. Yeah, sure. No, absolutely. I think it is it is a very good very good question. It's a discussion we have here. It's very, very much of the day at the moment. But I think the, the, the exit criteria have to be based around progress and strength of local institutions to take on those responsibilities. So maybe I can link it back, Corinna, if you don't mind, to the corruption question, which is there as well, which is another, another good one about how do we tackle practically, how do we actually tackle corruption if we are talking about institutions themselves which are corrupt? Um, I think the first thing, again, is these are not unique challenges. The, these are countries in transition challenges, which we, we see in many places around the world. And so, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel on that. It has to be some sort of combination of a, a sort of a third one person described recently as a pressure, pressure sandwich. So yes, we should be working with the institutions. We should not do their jobs for them or frankly stop holding them to account, the judiciary, um, parliaments, all of these important institutions, working with them, pressuring them, judging them on the track record, the results that they deliver. But at the same time, we have to be working directly with citizens to help them in terms of transparency, which I think is incredibly important in the fight against corruption. Transparency is the, uh, it's the detergent um, for tackling the problem of, of corruption. You know, it, opening this up, where is the money spent? Uh, where, where, are where do the decisions go? making that information available to citizens so they themselves can hold their institutions to account. That's the kind of sandwich that we're talking about. And so coming back around to that question about international supervision and graduation out of the high representative, I think um, that is the basis on which not just the international, but I think people in this country want to see uh, that, that period ended. It has to be on the basis of progress of those institutions, confidence, especially in the rule of law, Rule of law is very complicated in many areas of reforms, but we can actually make it quite simple. When no one is above the law, um, when the law applies to everyone equally, that's when you have efficient institutions, that's when you have the rule of law. And so these are the kind of criteria I think that citizens want us to use. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, I want to give the floor to um, one of our participants who is brave enough and has raised his hand. Um, Tamer Kilic, would you mind asking your question now? Thank you. I would like to thank all of you for organizing this event and also special thanks to distinguished speakers for giving this first-hand information about the policies of UK in relation to Western Balkans. Actually, <clears throat> uh, uh, I'm regional coordinator of ICMPD, responsible for Western Balkans and Turkey. Um, joining from uh, Turkey, regards to all of you. My question is about the migration uh, situation in Western Balkans. As we all know, number of stranded migrants in Western Balkans are increasing. Considering the developments on Eastern Mediterranean route, I think in coming years, we may see more uh, migrants stranded in Western Balkans. But also uh, there is a reality that uh, immigration is also an important problem of Western Balkans and brain drain which is affecting the socio-economic stability of the region. And Western Balkan countries are cooperating very well with EU. And we are also going to see the implication of upcoming pact of EU migration and asylum over Western Balkans. In that regard, I would like to ask the distinguished uh, panelists uh, about prioritization of UK on migration matters in, in Western Balkans. And also considering the implication of COVID pandemic in the region, uh, both on uh, immigration and immigration, how you will be determining your prioritization and how you will be supporting uh, Western Balkan countries in this important agenda. Thank you. Right. Um, I will also add to that a question 
um, for Ms. Lexman uh, regarding the UK-US uh, cooperation uh, in the region. If this is to intensify and to um, have successes, um, do you think that it could, uh, in a sense, deal a blow to uh, some of the long-standing uh, efforts uh, of the EU in the region? Ms. Lexman. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, I did not understand because the connection is not very well. Uh, the question that if the cooperation, the UK US cooperation, but I didn't understand in relation to with the EU. If it intensifies and if it manages to, to score successes in the region on issues on which the EU has been trying to um, move forward uh, over the years, uh, do you think, uh, how, how do you think that would be perceived on the EU side? You mean how the EU side will perceive the strengthening of the cooperation between UK and US? Yes, and potential yeah. strides forward as a result of that cooperation in the region. Okay, thank you very much. I think that in the interest of the EU is to be part of the of the cooperation rather than comment on the cooperation between the EU and the US. And I, I, I truly believe that there is a lack of uh, cooperation with the US on many issues, I mean, from the European Union. And I really hope that this, this, we will catch up with this lack of cooperation on all fronts, not only in the Western Balkans. I would maybe mention one example, which is very explicit, is that the EU was not waiting uh, with the investment deal with China for the new US administration. I think this was a great failure because this was exactly the, the great opportunity for the EU uh, and the US to coordinate our efforts vis-a-vis uh, -vis such a great challenge as China represents for both of us and, and globally. And I believe and I hope so that, um, that the EU will make more efforts to uh, I would say uh, increase cooperation with the US on any many different fronts, including the cooperation on security and defense and the cooperation which will uh, lead to our greater engagement and synergy of our efforts in the Western Balkans. And for that reason, I would say that I don't, yeah, we should not comment on the cooperation between UK and the US, but we should be part of it on an equal footing. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Uh, would anyone want to take uh, Mr. Kilic's uh, question uh, regarding uh, migration and border management? I think if I may, uh, hospital pass, pass that one to Matt. There's been such focus on migration in BIH in Bosnia-Herzegovina, but there is also quite a deep reference to that in the integrated review on our commitment to keep on tackling migration. But if Matt would like to take that. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, so this is, uh, no, this is absolutely you know, very clearly spelled out in the integrated review about um, managing this movement of people, particularly with our European partners. You know, th this is a geographically defined problem as well. And one thing, sort of an observation from, from the ground here in Bosnia, where we see some of those challenges really sort of coming to a head against that, sort of up against that border with the EU. Um, I do think that this is one where you know, a significant uh, effort and a, a, an understanding of the, what those pressures look like on the ground for people in parts of this country. I think um, there has an awful lot been done. Uh, the EU in particular has, has borne a large amount of the costs, frankly, of housing and accommodating a lot of those. Um, but frankly, the, those sort of addressing the problem just at this end, uh, rather than upstream, means that you're always going to be coming up against a geographically defined problem here in Bosnia. So holistic approach, looking at where the, the flows are coming through and the fact that many of them, frankly, are coming through EU countries already. Um, so th this, is, this is not a problem which should just be put on the shoulders of one country on the edge of the EU. Now, now this is, um, none of this is easy. Tamara knows that better than any of us, but I think it, whatever it is, it has to be both that combination of helping accommodate and deal with the problem um, in a sort of humane, responsible way, 
frankly, so the Bosnia meets its international obligations, but also recognizing that this is a problem that has come through a number of other countries on the way uh, and looking at how else that can be accommodated and, and those burdens shared more equitably. I think Sonada might be very well placed to comment on this. Absolutely. I, I, I've already seen her raising her hand. Sonada, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, just to add uh, to what Matt said, uh, it's not even um, this migration uh, crisis is not even on the shoulders of the whole Bosnia Herzegovina. It's on one region, um, and we have come in a situation that uh, town of Bihać and the region of Krajina has to bear a huge problem that has not created and does not have resources to solve uh, and. I would say as long as the Balkan uh, migration route is active, we will have this situation, which is far beyond even the whole Western Balkan region to uh, resolve. Uh, uh, so there is, uh, there has to be uh, additional effort on the part of the uh, EU to uh, manage migration. Um, uh, but we will be extinguishing fires, I think, for, for the years ahead. But one suggestion, and this is also related to security discussion that we have had. One of the reasons why Bosnia have, has this uh, migration humanitarian crisis on its western part is because its eastern border is not very well secured and managed. And we have resistance within the Bosnian political leadership to strengthen the eastern border, which would offer better control of, my, of movement of migrants from Serbia to Bosnia. So if the UK can help with convincing political leadership in Bosnia-Herzegovina to get assistance from the EU or to strengthen their own police uh, presence on the eastern border, I think the migration situation in Bosnia would be improved in a sense that we would at least have some knowledge of the movement of these uh, people. And then uh, I think just a comment to everything that we have said so far, um, especially with the aspect what the international community can and should do in the Balkans in all these different areas, policy areas that we have uh, discussed. Matt has used a nice metaphor of a pressure sandwich. And uh, there has to be empowerment or strengthening support to citizens from below. And there should be um, uh, top down pressure on the elites to make, make a change. But we already also know this, what should be done so we have, we have a model, we know what are the um, uh, goals, um, strategies have been written. I think it is really high time to implement and to show that we actually uh, walk the walk, not, not only uh, talk, talk the talk. Uh, this would be the best message to the people in the Western Balkans that actually something is changing. Right. Um, we are almost out of time, so I will uh, ask the, um, the last uh, three questions and then I will uh, give all of you the opportunity to say uh, some concluding uh, remarks. Um, the first one is whether I can get a little bit more detail um, about the potential involvement of the UK in the uh, Serbia-Kosovo dialogue. Uh, but also if you can um, tell us a little bit more about um, uh, the UK's role now uh, into the Berlin process. Uh, and finally, we have a question from Paul Butcher, who is uh, saying, how can the UK say that EU membership is good for the Balkans if it doesn't believe EU membership is good for the UK? How do, does the UK counteract that? Or how do our other speakers think that the UK can counteract that? Um, that's all. Um, I just come back for a final round and uh, maybe I'll first give the floor to Mr. Page because he's been quiet for a while and, um, and then we'll continue. Very good. If I may, I'll take the first two, Serbia, Kosovo, Berlin process, and I'll ask Matt to take the third. I know that all our ambassadors in the six uh, countries of the Western Balkans 
are very used to answering that paradox question, so I'll leave it to him. Um, the first one, Serbia Kosovo, I'm very involved with uh, day in, day out. I would say it's pretty well the most difficult, intractable um, of our, you know, disputes between two countries of the region, but also potentially the most important if it could be resolved and lead to a comprehensive, conclusive normalization agreement. And the Americans add to that formula leading to mutual recognition. And that's caused a lot of uh, discussion um, since it was used by uh, the US president uh, on the national day. Um, what I would say is that this is the topic above all for which uh, Miro Lajcak was recruited, although he does also have a remit for looking at other intra-Western Balkans bilateral disputes, but he spends most time on this one. So before him did Miss Mogherini and so before her did Cathy Ashton, with whom we still have a lot of contact back here incidentally, because uh, Miro Lajcak used to work for her and she still takes a very active interest in the region and knows the protagonists. And so we've been involved in this for a long time, ever since the contact group, and uh, have kind of charted in our foreign office and in our embassies, uh, the work that's been done in the past, uh, the Brussels agreement, all of the uh, sub-agreements, if you like, within the process that have been reached over those years. People differ as to how many there are, between 30 and 50. And we're doing a lot of work and thinking behind the scenes in order to support Miro Lajcek. We do that with all of our Quint partners. and. Uh, I keep saying to people that were we to achieve, uh, if it's this year, next year, after Serbian elections, whenever it might be, but before Serbia comes into the EU, that's critical. Were we to achieve a, an agreement, a deal, a comprehensive deal, uh, which led to Kosovo being recognized, uh, that would have a transformational effect on the entire region, not least on Kosovo, of course, uh, but it would also make a major impact on their progress towards EU accession and the citizens would be the first to benefit from that. So the prize is big, and it's the biggest thing that gets me up every morning. Um, and I'm fascinated in the detail, which I won't go into here, but it's very important to all of us, and particularly to the people in the region. Secondly, Berlin process. Berlin process doesn't deal with Serbia Kosovo because there's a separate EU-led process. But I do think, in great tribute to Chancellor Merkel, who set this up in 2014, it's achieved a great deal since it uh, started then. And we'll hear more about that in the Berlin summit in Berlin this year, in July, August time, hosted by Chancellor Merkel again, ring composition. But we, the UK, have taken a very active interest in this and uh, been active after our summit as well, because it's the one annual set piece occasion now when our senior ministers get together with uh, six Western Balkans prime ministers, as well as you know, 10 European EU member state leaders. And that's very valuable in itself, because we're not at the EU 27 meeting each year, the one that happened in Zagreb last year, Ljubljana this autumn. And we do think that it's achieved a huge amount, and we will be celebrating that in Berlin Summit, I'm sure. You can look at some of the money that's come in on connectivity, road, rail, infrastructure, broadband, and so on the kind of progress from what was the regional economic area in Trieste through to the common regional market now, common investment destination, better connectivity between the six countries, recognition of academic qualifications across borders. RCC has done good work on ID cards and ease of flow of people. There's a lot further to go, but likewise, the Green Agenda, which was agreed in Sofia Summit last year, there's lots to build on. And we're very keen to build on aspects, in your words, Karina, where we can add most value. And that includes areas including tackling, uh, tackling corruption, uh, including illicit finance, which matters to us all. Also trying to help the young uh, through entrepreneurship and education and digital skills, building on our 21st century schools for school children right across the Balkans, giving them coding and digital literacy. So those are the two that we're probably going to carry on working on after the Berlin summit, but we're talking to the Germans about that. And I think hats off to Chancellor Merkel for what she's achieved in launching it. Thank you so much. Ms. Lexman, any concluding words from your side? Thank you very much. There was not really a clear question for me, but I would maybe just say uh, two points. Uh, what is our greatest challenge? And it, this is definitely for all the three parties we are mentioning, the UK, the US and the EU, is that we are focusing on the practical help to individuals, as well as the kind of strategic influence and strategic cooperation uh, set uh, through our different parts of the, of the, of the policies vis-a-vis uh, -vis Western Balkans. But what I think we need to 
strengthen is also the way how we communicate what we actually do in the region because this is very important that i have i my impression is that the population of the western balkans does not know the great involvement of uh, of the eu but also the uk and the us in the region and the great help we are providing for for the region so i think we we have to strengthen our efforts there but but now a comment for the eu and i'm trying to be vocal about it that we have to strengthen our commitments to the enlargement or to the unification <laughs> as uh, as ambassador phil has nicely called it because if there is no trust from the western balkans that we are serious about the enlargement or about the unification then obviously all the carrots can be left uh, behind because the carrots will be offered by by china or russia so i i would conclude here thank you very much and thank you for this very timely discussion thank you thank you so much Sarada, would you would you like to give us your uh, final words? Yes, uh, I would like to underline actually uh, uh, and maybe refer to a question that Matt <laughs> has to answer. Um, I think uh, we also in the Balkans need to ask ourselves like it's not what the US wants or what the EU wants, or what the UK wants, Russia, China, Turkey. It is what we want. And I think we very uh, rarely ask ourselves, what is it that we want from our countries? What is it that we want from, from, from our uh, uh, leaders? What, kind, what, what, what is the vision for this region, for, for my community? And uh, I, we had this discussion on the role of the UK and the EU in the Western Balkans, but I want to finish with putting the responsibility on the Western Balkans, on us, for the future of our countries. And uh, um, we mentioned St. Patrick's Day uh, uh, and uh, congratulations to all for celebrating. It's a very nice uh, holiday. Um, uh, I also want to finish with uh, what uh, Shakespeare, uh, one of his sentences uh, or uh, statements was that he feels always happy because he has no expectations. So I think we in the Western Balkans should really lower our expectations and try to do as much as we can for ourselves. And then any assistance from outside is welcome, but uh, the job needs to be done at home. Thank you so much. Ambassador, at last you get to close the curtain for us. Yeah, thank you. Although I think it's a shame we didn't finish with Sonata because I think that would have been a perfect conclusion, but um, uh, I hope not to ruin it. So just very quickly to pick up some of those questions, uh, including one that we skipped over, I think, on public administration with Krasimir. Um, I mean, just on that to say, every crisis is an opportunity. And the current crisis genuinely is an opportunity to change some of the ways that things are done in, in this country and other places through digitalization, through increasing transparency tapping into some of those successful sectors that we actually have in Bosnia and elsewhere, like the, in IT. Great successes that we should build on and replicate. A lot of this is about depoliticization and professionalization, not just public administration, but of state-owned companies, government more generally, armed forces. And, and frankly, we do that together. So we do that, yes, the EU, Sigma, all of those tools, but by all of us being joined up on that same page. That's the first one on par. On hypocrisy, yes, I do get asked this a lot. I think there's actually a pretty straightforward answer to it, which is I would be a hypocrite if I ever said that, if I told the country to join a club that we have left. But I don't think we say that. I think what we say is the people of this country have made a choice and we will support that choice. I mean, in Bosnia, it's 80% support for the PAR. And there is an alignment of what we hope to see in terms of this country succeeding and those changes that are necessary. We'll support those changes. We're here as a proven friend. That's the best answer, I think, to those um, charges of hypocrisy. Just quickly, because um, there's a couple of things that Miriam and Senator both, uh, both said that I think are incredibly important. The thing about security and security infrastructure that Miriam mentioned, I think is really important. Um, uh, things like cyber, things like energy, it, it's serious investments in the security of this infrastructure is critical for this region. It is contested and absolutely is bringing in more of those positive investments, so investments which are long-term and, and collaborative, not the, uh, the quick wins. And on disinformation, Miriam mentioned as well, absolutely a critical part of the battle in this space. Um, Sonata mentioned good things about uh, the search for partners, search for citizens that we can work alongside, but a really critical point that we, we skipped over maybe a little bit about elections. 
elections should be the start of things and often uh, unfortunately they're the start of the problems here so focusing on improvements to the election process so that people feel it is worth choosing something worth voting and worth worth choosing reformers i do think that's a really worthwhile and, and valuable investment raul in the in the comments uh, the questions had a good good challenge about whether we're turning up in the right ways i think turning up economically is a really big part of that i think we have to keep turning up we have to keep showing up bring in the investments bring in our companies these are the things that we need to keep doing keep turning up in all these areas um, and then uh, hopefully we can start to support exactly the kind of changes Sanada says that is driven not by what we say, but by what people in these countries want to see. Thank you. And on that note, um, I also want to thank uh, you, our speakers, for your excellent contributions and to thank our participants for their patience and for their active contribution to this event. Um, this is an issue on which we'll continue to be working. I'm sure at some point we'll come back and take stock of how this cooperation between the EU and the UK in the region is going. Until then, I wish everyone a wonderful afternoon and I look forward to welcoming you again at an EPC event uh, in the very near future. Bye bye.